in categorizes information that way. We, 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 we think we know who each other are and we put each other in these little boxes, especially our parents, and then they stay there. They stay yeah. there and there's no room for expansion. And we think that we know everything about them. And your parents had an entire life before you. Hi, Lucy. How are you? Hi, <laughs> I am really great, Adam. Thank you for having me. Of course. Well, this is about you and your journey in music. And of course, the book, which I'm really excited to, to talk to you about as well. And I know you got a lot of projects, a podcast and a whole yes, lot of stuff going on. So I do. Uh, yes. I'm happy to be here to chat with you for for a bit, even though you're in the midst of a snowstorm. Yeah, it's all right, though. <laughs> I was well, actually I, listening to your EP uh, earlier today. Oh, yeah. Awful, awful. Sorry is such a good song. Thank you very much. I did that with Lester Mendez over at Henson Studios in, in Hollywood. Wow. Lester's incredible. He's just worked with a ton of artists. And I was so excited to get to do part of my album with him. Yeah, it's a great yeah. song. I love that song. I love that one, too. And the newest one, Enough, is really good, too. Thank you very much. Yeah, I wrote that with a guy named Tyson Kelly, who I've played with for a long time. And he is currently traveling the world in uh, the number one Beatles tribute band. He plays John Lennon. <laughs> no way. That's awesome. Do they, so they dress up and play the whole part. Yeah. That's it's cool. amazing. I know. So I wrote awful, uh, which one are we talking about? I wrote enough oh. with him and that song came out of a really painful breakup. So that's the gift in these experiences that we have to have sometimes in life is that we get a good song out of it. <laughs> there you go. Um, and you have relation or not relations, but you're related to a beetle, right? In 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 some yeah. way, like uh your uh, grandma. Yeah, yeah. Right? My grandma? Is it your grandma or your <laughs> stepmom? My grandma's not a beetle, no. No, um, but your grandma no, I know I'm teasing. <laughs> Actually, uh Ringo is my uncle. Uncle, there you go. That's so crazy. Yeah, it's it's a wild ride having a beetle in the family. <laughs> The fans and, and, and an eagle in the family. <laughs> and an eagle in the family, yes. Yes, there are a lot of musicians um, flapping about in my family, but they'll tell you, you know, my dad always says that, because his mom was a classical pianist, and so am I, and he always says that it skipped a generation and and went to me, and he's just stuck there in the middle. But we, we've had a lot of musicians in our family on both sides. Incredible. With uh, was piano the first instrument you learned? Was that something you were drawn to? It was. Yeah. I I so I grew up with my mom's mom, who my book is about. Okay. She she taught me how to sing harmonies with the gospel singing, and she played the Hammond organ. She had one in her living room, so I got all that ear training. Mm -hmm. And then on the other side, my dad's mom is just a sight reading musician. She was. Um, one of the pianists for the New York City Ballets. And she she tried to teach me the sight reading side of music, which I never took to until I got with my coach when I was 20 years old. And that's when I really dove into the technical theoretical side of music. So I really had this amazing foundation in all aspects of musicianship. Mm -hmm. And it has allowed me to become a very, very um, great musician. <laughs> you know, I have all these different skills. A lot of musicians will have like one or the other. And I've just had a really well-rounded education. So um, I created my own performing arts studio, the Lucy Walsh Performing Arts Studio in Los Angeles. And I coach people all over the world on Zoom and in person. Um, it's really incredible. I, I have a full roster of musicians that I that I work with. Do you teach uh, all, a lot of different instruments or what do, you, what do you typically teach? Piano? I teach piano, voice, acting. And wow. then I have a roster of guest coaches that teach pretty much any instrument you'd like. And the the unique thing about my studio is that my coaches are literal rock stars. So if you go on my website and take a look at who I've got teaching for me, it's pretty exciting. <laughs> yeah. What's what website? I went to a lot of your links on your link tree. Um, is, yeah, it on, is it the yeah, uh, Lucy Walsh performing arts studio.com. 
Okay, I'll have to check it out after because I'm really excited yeah. to, to see. That's but cool. I, I never, I never planned on coaching. I never planned on that being a part of my life because I have a, a very full career. And sure. <laughs> it, it really happened during the pandemic. I was coaching a few clients and then people just start word of mouth. I've never advertised. It's just word of mouth. And um, it's boomed. It is thriving. And I'm so grateful for that income because as you know, you know as an artist, we're always wondering where our next job is going to come from and, and projects take time. So to have built my own business and have that as a constant has been such a blessing in my life, not to mention the incredible clients that I work with. They just, it's so incredible to be a part of people's journey right. in their, and, and it's an honor to get to accompany them. Um, and I have a lot of children that I coach. And so I take that very seriously. I, I really protect my clients. And I came from a family where privacy was always protected. And so I really like, I'm very careful about posting anything without consent and all that kind of thing, you know? Yeah. I would imagine Yeah, having a, a, just due to the, you know, the public eye of, of your family, it must be hard to kind of, you, you'd want to be private, right? I mean, it has been a really, a really, really, uh, incredible journey I've I've been on with growing up in a very famous family I've dealt with a lot of things including a stalker uh all oh kinds gosh. of yeah it's pretty crazy you got to be careful yeah I bet wow well especially so now because we're all so visible with technology and social media and you forget sometimes that you're a public figure and it can happen to anybody people get very strange and they have a lot more access to you now than ever and uh we have to remember that yeah no 100 percent. if you post something just thinking like oh like somebody would like to see this and then you're like wait a minute that's right. <laughs> now no someone knows where i was at this time i mean yeah it can that's get real right dicey. i actually got in a fight with a friend of mine who would check me in like on facebook you know how you can check oh me yeah parties? i put her up against a wall i said don't you ever ever check yeah. me in somewhere no, yeah, that could get sketchy for sure. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. Oh, anyway, man. yes, it's been a crazy ride I've been on in this life. Yeah. Wow. So when you start piano, was that something that you wanted to do? Like how how influential like was your I mean, having a huge musical family, but like was was your dad like, oh, I, I you know, Lucy, I want you to be, you know, musically inclined or like you know, like kind of pushing you towards music or the opposite. Cause I've, I've had other people on that <laughs> parents were in, in bands of really big bands. And it was kind of like, well, you know, this is really difficult. So let's try to do something. Different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny. Most people are really um, steered away from being an artist as a career, but I was the opposite. My, like I couldn't have pursued anything else. It really was all that is important in my family. We don't have doctors, we don't have lawyers in past generations, but not any of my parents. And so it, it really was something that I just, I always knew. I just always knew what, what I wanted. I've always known what I've wanted. I never was one of those people that kind of got out of school and kind of floated around for a while trying to figure it out. I knew from five years old, that this is what felt right to me. And I was very supported in that by my family. And the amazing thing is I got to grow up around these prolific artists like my dad and my uncle who have had a long career. Anyone can book one job, but to have a career is something completely different. That requires a work ethic that people have no idea goes on behind closed doors. And mm -hmm. I got to see that. And that's really, really helped me in my own career because I saw the hundreds of hours that my dad put in to make it look easy on stage. Right. Yeah. That's definitely something that people don't quite understand when they, at least yeah. when I was trying to, as a kid, just, I was never good. So I was like, Oh, I want to learn how to be in a, like being a band would be so cool. And you just think all these guys just get to show up and, and, you know, hang out and party and do these things and just come out and play their songs and that's it. But it, if you you really have to look at the amount of work that comes into to being able to to get to the level of okay, I can go out every night and I can play to a stadium full of people. 
That's right. Yeah, it requires a workmanship that is extraordinary. And that's why not everybody gets there. Uh, <laughs> very small amount of people get there. Very right? small. Honestly, it's like a, the tiniest fraction of a percentage that actually achieves a lifelong career like what I have seen in my family. And and my dad always said, you got to be able to deliver live on stage. You got to be able to deliver live. That's all it comes down to. And mm. I'm just disgusted by the music business these days. I just, I barely pay attention to it because it's a load of crap and it's shit. And what I hear coming out is shit, quite honestly. And they can't deliver live. And it's just pointless in my opinion yeah it's so <laughs> total, it's totally different even within the last like three or four years it's like, like yeah you can just go on and make some song that somehow goes viral on you know tiktok or whatever it may be social media wise it's like oh okay now this person matt they have a fan base and this and maybe they've probably never played a show maybe they don't have another song that's right it's like they have never played a show and it's just it's just it's a, it's um it's a crime to me. It's a crime against what we do. And I um you know the the book I've written Remember Me as Human has to do with the power of human connection. Mm -hmm. And that's what I stand for as a person and in my art, you know, whatever it may be and that's what I teach with my with my clients and pass it on because that is uh, what's most important and we're losing it. We're losing it with the advancement of technology. We're losing it with our shorter attention spans. People don't have shorter attention spans. They don't. <laughs> yeah. If they're captivated by something, if they feel a human connection, like right now I'm looking at you, we're on a screen, unfortunately, but your eyes are so captivating to me. We're sharing a moment. I can feel it. I can feel that you're really here with me. You're really present. And we are craving that so much as humans. And that's why depression has skyrocketed because we're missing it. It's going away and we have to fight for it. And that's why I've written this book. And that's what I'm here to talk about. And, and it's very important to me. Yeah, I really want to get into this book. So uh, you obviously have had a successful career outside of writing this book, but going into it, like what was kind of the idea? I know you kind of went, you went in and had a long conversation with, with your grandmother. Is that correct? And yeah. was that, was it, was that just, oh, I want to go and spend time with her and these stories started to come out and you're like, oh, wow, like this would, I need to write this down. Like how, how, tell me about how the book began and, and even going into that first conversation with your grandma. So when I was 17, my grandmother, Wanda, she's my mom's mom. She gave me the 63 remaining love letters that my grandfather Dale had written to her in World War II when he wow. was Wow, he would send fighting. them back to her? That's incredible. Yes. Um, they wrote hundreds between them, but only 63 have survived. None of hers survived. He had to burn them all because he was over right behind the front lines from 1943 to 1945. And he couldn't keep her letters. And he writes in some of his letters how devastated he was to have to burn them all. So she gave me these 63 letters, which That's I have right behind so me in special. the cabinet over here. And it, it is special. It's incredible to have a, a, a such an important piece of history that way. And when I, when I got them, I was only 17 and I didn't have a professional career yet because my mom wouldn't let me until I was 18. <laughs> but I knew what a big deal these were. And I knew that I wanted to turn them into a film someday. And I didn't know how to go about doing that. So all I, all I knew was that I wanted Ron Howard and Tom Hanks to be a part of it because <laughs> they were amazing. guys that were making the movies like what this needed to be. Right. And so I set my sights on Ron Howard and Tom Hanks, both of whom are now aware of the project. That's and awesome. I would, I would carry these letters around in my purse, figuring that if I bumped into Ron Howard, I could pitch him the story. Um, <laughs> I didn't have any way to make this happen yet, but I started collecting answers. So I, I started interviewing my family members to, to learn more about 
the things that my grandparents were talking about in the letters to start to fill in the story around the letters because I needed to find a through line, right? I needed to find the story. The story, correct. Yeah. Exactly. And so I spent years doing that. And in my 20s, my grandfather, Dale, who had written the letters, he died with Alzheimer's before I got the chance to ask him much of anything. And that really scared me. And it really propelled me further into asking questions yeah, of people those while answers. they were still yeah. here. Because I saw Alzheimer's rip his memories away from him. And I think that my interviewing everybody was my way of not letting Alzheimer's win ever again. You know, I felt like if I can just collect every last memory, I can keep this person alive forever and all Alzheimer's won't win them, you know? Um, so I would say that had a lot to do with spurring me on in this project. So that led me um, as my music career picked up, which kind of happened at the same time as acting was my number one love in my life, in my early life. All of a sudden music took off. I was touring the world. I had record deals. I was signed by Jay-Z to Island Def Jam. Yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> you know, I, I went on to, to do some incredible things. I've played the biggest venues in the world. I've sung for presidents. I've done all kinds of stuff. And I really forgot about the letters. Not that I forgot, but it just seemed so daunting to me. I just didn't really think that I was the one to be able to take it over the finish line. Mm -hmm. And I sat with it for a long time since I was 17 has been quite a long time. I won't say how long, but <laughs> <laughs> this has been a, a long time coming. So once I had a moment to breathe and I turned back to the letters, I decided to go to my grandmother's nursing home and interview her on camera for three days about her life and the letters. And oh, she was wow. 97 years old. That I didn't realize she did it on camera too. That's, that's so cool. I did, yes. And I plan to make a documentary out of all this beautiful footage. Love that. So I went and I sat with her. She was 97 and we had our three day interview and it was our final conversation because she died four months later. Oh and this book, Remember Me as Human, is the story of those three final days that I spent with my grandmother. Oh, my gosh. So going, I'm sorry to hear about your grandmother. That's, I, it was my, 14 years. She was oh, 97. Still, it's okay. I don't know. My, I lost my grandfather a handful of years ago, too, and it's still devastating. And, I, and I'm I similar to you where I keep, I was able to go through his stuff and keep all these old things that he had he played baseball for the cleveland indians and i have like his original like, contract that he signed in the 40s and he went to world war ii as well so uh yeah. when you're talking about those letters i was like wow like that's i think that's amazing that you're able to save those um yeah and i'm actually starting a podcast once i have a moment to breathe after the book comes out where I am having people come on and share their family letters. So would you please come be a guest on my podcast and we can talk about oh, your grandfather? I would, I would love it. That would be so cool. I, I'm hundred percent in and I, Good. I have a lot of his cool stuff and that would be amazing. That would make my day, honestly. Um, wow. Uh, so well, so go, go, going into talk to, grandma's 97 at the time and you're like, okay, I want to do this thing. And she must, Obviously, I still have a really good memory of all these things happening. She had a great memory. So does it start off with how your grandparents met or like where does the book kind of pick up? And then how does that go into, you know, other people? That you, I'm curious, other people you've interviewed and how it all kind of relates to these these letters. That's a great question. And it's it, it was a big daunting task that I had to again figure out the story and, and what was the story that I wanted to tell because there's so much here so the book is really a memoir it's my memoir as well as much as my grandmother's it goes in and out of the letters uh and it goes in and out of my life so you're going back in history all the way to my ancestors that first came over from England and you're going forward into my life. And I talk about growing up with who my dad was and how, how it all affected me. And really, I didn't expect it to be such a personal memoir, 
but it really is tied in with my grandparents because I wrote this book as a gift to everyone who reads it because we are all trying to figure out who we are through where we've come from and who our ancestors were. And we are all trying to figure out who we are and what makes us human. And the response, even though it's just, it hasn't released yet, it publishes on March 12th, the response of people who have read some of it and, and heard about it has been extraordinary because we are all dying to live in our core of being human. We all have that in common. And so it's really a celebration of that. And my hope is that even though I'm talking about my life and how these things affected me, uh, going through my grandfather's death with Alzheimer's, being in the nursing home and experiencing elderly people just sitting there in a corner with no visitors. Yeah. Um, my hope is that everybody can connect with themselves on a deeper level because we've all experienced these things and they're hard to talk about. Grief is hard to talk about. Nobody taught us how to talk about grief. And I stand for having these conversations and, and, sh and sharing our humanity instead of trying to cover it up with filters and happy smiles on Instagram. Let's go into the important things that keep us in the light and that remind us that we're not alone, that we don't need to try to be somebody else, that who we are is just fine. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and I've heard a lot of people say, you know, it's like, you're the only, you're the only you or either you're, there's one you have, your fingerprint is different than everyone else in the entire world, which is hard to believe. It really right? is. I mean, it really is. And I just bring it back to, you know, I'm giving you a long answer to your question. No, this but. is beautiful. I don't, I usually don't. It's more of, I ask one basic question and we just go off. I know, it. I know. And I do <laughs> love a good, I do uh, love to tangent, but, but yeah, the book goes in and out of the letters. It goes in and out of what I experienced in that nursing home with my grandmother. And it goes in and out of her life and in and out of my life. Wow. And then and when, you say you kind of is a memoir of you. So are you going through, I would imagine, I don't know if you feel comfortable talking about just growing up in a household with, you know, your dad is in this, the, one of the biggest bands of all time. Like, was yeah. that something that was it hard because maybe he was on the road a lot or were you able to go on tour with him or like, how was, I don't know if you, you mind talking a little bit about that, just like being at home and then having this figure it's just larger. I mean, it's just the band is just larger than mine. Yeah, it was an extraordinary experience. I'm so grateful that I had it. And the reason I write about it in the book is because it gave me a very unique look behind the scenes of what it is to be famous and what um how, how much that is smoke and mirrors. Mm -hmm. Because I saw my dad as my regular dad. <laughs> and then I saw him in the public eye. And I went, huh. So fame is bullshit. <laughs> because <laughs> he's just a normal guy. You know what I mean? And I got to see that. And I think it gave me a very healthy perspective on it all. And brings me right back to remember me as human. It's all about going into this humanity instead of the smoke and mirrors. So yes, growing up, my dad didn't get sober until I was 12. So before that, he was off. He was on the road. He was living quite um, quite a crazy life oh, yeah. you know, before he got sober. And my mom kept me very far away from the world of celebrity. She really gave me a very normal and protected childhood. I had a stepfather in the house who is like us, like, like my father as well. So I'm so grateful that she did that for me because I'm half normal <laughs> <laughs> at this point. 
And I write about in the book when I was 12 years old and my dad got sober and went back to work with the Eagles, I realized, whoa, wait, who's my dad? Yeah. What? And I, I had these crazy experiences where I was at the Rose Bowl and it was sold out like 78,000 people or whatever. And the roar of the crowd when I was 12 years old from watching up in a box, I just had like tears streaming down my face. And I just, I was just, I'd never heard anything like that. And it was my dad on stage. And that's when I went, okay, wait a second. I got to like figure this out. What is going on here? And it was, it was very exciting. And that's when I got to go on, on tour and experience the private jets and the the police <laughs> escorts and and all of that and and recently my dad was awarded the Kennedy Center honor by Obama along mm -hmm. with Al Pacino and James Taylor and some other people that year and I got to go and I was at the White House with him and it was a family event because the entire family has been along to make this possible. Mm -hmm. Your entire family is on that train when you are that level of, you know, an artist. Yeah, right. Um, it takes so everybody, right? I mean, that's right. It takes everybody. And it's not easy. My dad and I are doing very well right now. We are really um, taking a lot of steps to, to be as close as we both want to be, which we haven't had in years past. Mm -hmm. And the great thing and the most healing thing that my dad and I share is the music. Mm -hmm. We can always come together in the music, no matter what has happened and what's going on between us. The music is an unspoken language that we share. And I look forward to a lot of work together with him in, in the future, but it's it's been a nutty, nutty, nutty life to um, be the daughter of a celebrity and go through the ego of that because for so long I wanted to be like, the rock star daughter that was, or I felt <laughs> like I needed to be that. Yeah. I felt like I had a role to play. And when, when I'd look around me and I'd see the other rock star daughters, you know, like Kim Stewart and the Jaggers and sure. And, and Liv Tyler and all these people. And I'd see them on these red carpets, like playing the part. And I would think, huh, well, I want to be like that, but I'm not really like that. Like I'm, I, I'm not, and maybe they're not either. Maybe they were looking at me and thinking the same thing. Cause you know, we all, everybody, you, you included everybody in the world kind of plays off each other. And we look to our right and our left to kind of figure out what to do sometimes right, instead right. of, instead of like coming from our authentic humanity. And the more I've let go of the ego of, of trying to be the rock star daughter and just who I am, mm -hmm. it's been a much happier life. And that's really what led me to writing the book was because I never thought of myself as smart. I always wanted to write, but I thought you had to go to school for that. I thought I was stupid because I never really did well in school. Mm -hmm. And um, I played Which a role. isn't the case at all. I mean, nowadays, School don't you agree like, aren't there things that you've wanted to achieve and you're like oh i couldn't do that like i i don't have the uh, proper credentials or whatever 100 percent, yeah or just kind of self-doubt and you know ah you know maybe i shouldn't do that or uh you think it's something you want and then you for me too it's like do i have time or do am i would i really be that good at it like i yeah, yeah uh, it's there's all that and and i really i agree with you too when it talks like it's a hard to be your true authentic self because you're always constantly seeing other people doing things you're like oh that looks cool maybe i should go with that instead of just being like i like this i want to do this it i feel the judgment you know or am i gonna get judged from other people think that if you know for you and i'm like okay i want to be a musician and i've talked to like i said other musicians that have parents that are famous and it's like Oh, well, she's only going to do that because she's got her dad to blah, 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 blah. And I'm sure that was probably a big, maybe you got that at some point or, you know, it, I could see 
there's just so much judgment I feel like around that you have to kind of quiet that and be like, I'm just going to do what I feel like. That's doing. right. And my dad always said to me, I'm not going to pick up the phone for you. I am not going to call and get you a record deal or anything. <laughs> if you want this, you're going to go out and do it yourself. Mm -hmm. And I did. I did. Yeah, you've got the name walking through the door, but if you can't deliver, nobody gives a fuck. Yeah, no one cares, right? You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Like, and you might get one job, like I said, but you're not gonna, you're not going to have a long career. And I'm so grateful that he he did that for me. I, I do think you are up against a lot of judgment, like you said, with people having preconceived notions about you. A lot of people, what I have to deal with mostly is people thinking that I have a shit ton of money, that I'm like a trust fund kid or whatever. Uh, yeah. And my dad's never treated me like that. Like all the other celebrity kids that I would go to school with or whatever, were driving around in like the hottest cars and he'd buy me like, like a bad car. I know this is really like, I still sound like a spoiled brat because he he has like bought me things like that, but he just never like did. He's not like that. He's a guy from the Midwest who, you know, worked hard for where he's at and he really instilled that in me. And so I would say, even if it's been a preconceived notion of like, oh, Joe Walsh's daughter, you know, is coming in or whatever, I I've always worked my ass off for everything mm -hmm. I've gotten. And I, I'm so proud of everything I've achieved because of that. And I'm very, a bit snotty and snooty about like people who don't work hard for things. No, I, I would imagine that would be the case. Cause I'm, I'm just thinking about that right now. Like if you were given everything, yeah. you know, like you were talking about, if you went to school and you're 16 and, and your dad's like, here's a new Mercedes, but it's That's like right. at that point you might be like, well, I, I, why am I going to try to do anything? Why am I going to work hard? Everything's right. kind of handed to me. That's but right. you and had the yeah. opposite. It was like, I'm, I'm going to work my ass off. I want to yeah. achieve this on my own and I'm not being yeah. handed everything. That's right. And I guess the bottom line is, is that I enjoy working for my passions. Mm -hmm. Like I enjoy working. I enjoy the process. I'm an actor. I'm Shakespeare trained. Yeah. I've done a, a lot, lot of shows of, yeah, a lot stuff, of yeah. theater I've done a lot of theater I've done television and film as well but um I enjoy the the process of putting the thing together of the creating I was so flabbergasted somebody recently asked me if I had used AI to write my book really and I was just like as if that's a real question at this point I yeah you're like Dear uh, Chat GTP, write a book about my grandma's <laughs> letters. <laughs> write a book telling me about my humanity. Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, right. Yeah. And so I'm very proud of the book, Remember Me as Human in This Time. I think it's a very timely read. Mm -hmm. I think that AI, as much as I appreciate the advancement of technology, I also am terrified of where we're headed. And I really do everything possible in my life to reel that back and keep it a human connection as much as I can. And that's why at this specific time in history, I am very, very proud to be putting this book out. I love it. I'm curious on how many people did you interview to contribute to the book? I mean, it, obviously your grandma and who else? were you kind of tapping to fill in pieces of the, of the story? My mom was a huge help. My okay. mom's been an enormous help. She has not enjoyed the process very much because she's very vulnerable. It's her life and her story and her parents. And um, I'm really grateful to her for giving me the trust to write about it all. And mm -hmm. You know, it's hard for people when there's a writer in the family. They have to put up with that exposure. And I understand why it's been so hard for her. So she was a big contributor. I really checked in with a lot of cousins in Illinois where the story takes place. Again, there are some things in the story that people aren't that happy about me talking about. There's a lot of skeletons in the closet of the family over the last 150 years. I mean, some of this stuff, a lot of it happened 
in past generations of the family and my family still protecting those those secrets and it's it's a fascinating part of what I write about because we can all relate to that where we have this family dynamic where we're protecting each other <clears throat> uh and that's and that gets passed down and it's a tricky thing to to break out of mm -hmm. so I do have a disclaimer at the top of the book that says you know my my uh memory of things may be different from yours but <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so it's just been a lot of relatives that have been gracious with their help and, and a lot of fact checking because this is a historical piece of writing as well. There are a lot of things that historically happened that I incorporate into it. And so my research has been enormous. I interviewed my grandmother in 2000 and it's now 2024. Yeah, and think of how much has no, happened. In sorry, that's when I got the letters. I interviewed okay. her in 2000. 10 but still in four you think 2010 i'm like oh that wasn't that long ago and then you think about how much has changed and i've kept saying oh, I, 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 I interviewed her you know it's taken me nine years to write the book because we still feel like it's 2019 before covid we lost a couple of years <laughs> yeah right and i'm like oh my god wait a second you started this book 14 years ago <laughs> was covid uh a way to you to help you <laughs> not help but i mean give you more time to work on the book it really was. When COVID happened, I really went to work seriously with deadlines and and really working it through to its completion. And also the film, <clears throat> excuse me, the film is happening. Oh, uh, it is. It is happening. Yes. So wow. stupidly, I I'll, I'll know I'll understand this about my second book, but I wrote a film and a book. Um, instead of just releasing the book and then having it get optioned and saving myself the trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But the interesting thing is the film I've written, which we're getting ready to go in uh, towards pre-production in 2024, wow. is is different than the book. The, the film does not deal with the granddaughter at the nursing home for the three days with her grandmother. The film is just back in time. It's this epic love story that takes place during the war and that's it. So they're actually two different stories. So the book could be optioned as well. <laughs> oh, so the, it sounds like the book, you know, kind of picks up where you go in and interview grandma, but the 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 film is more of their lo their love story before That's right. yeah, the everything film happens takes place, moving forward. Exactly. The film takes place during the war when they were newlyweds. Wow. Wow. Yeah. I'm sure you learned so much about yourself and your family doing this, uh, you know, writing this book. Was there some, like, could you think of like a, a couple of things that you're like shocked about or, or that you feel like or that you're willing to share? Like, whoa, I didn't, I would have never thought that this, I would have found this out. That's a really good question. Yes, I did learn an enormous amount about myself and my family. You know what I learned most is that I don't need to have an opinion or judgment about things that have happened. This book is very funny. It's it's got it all. It's tragic, it's dark. I deal with some very dark things including suicide, mental illness, molestation, rape. These are all things alcoholism. These are all things that my grandma talks about in her interview. Wow. But it's also hysterically funny because my grandmother, <clears throat> sorry, my grandmother was the funniest person you'd ever meet. So it's got it all. But I went into the interview and writing the book with a lot of judgment about certain things that I felt should have been handled differently by my grandparents. Uh, and I walked away with a real lesson in compassion, forgiveness, the releasing of judgment uh, that I didn't have before this process. John Patrick Shanley, the incredible playwright, 
director, you know, uh, of so many, you know, so many things. John Patrick Shanley, he said to me once, um, I'm at the stage in my life where I don't need to have an opinion on anything. And I really loved that because we get so opinionated and so caught up in our judgments and, oh, well, you know, they shouldn't have done that. Or I, I, I would never do that. Yes, you I, would. Yes, you would. Yeah, right. Being human, we are contradictions. We are a massive contradiction at all times. We say things we wouldn't do and then we do them. We stand for things and then we break our word. And it's okay. It's okay. That is part of being human and embracing that is what the story is all about. And so, yeah, that's what I learned. I Very personal things. An example of how it ties in with my life, even though it's in my grandmother's interview, is like her father killed himself. Her oh my father, God. my great-grandfather, hung himself in the barn. And I have his suicide letter in my stuff over here. Like you said, you have so many amazing things of your grandfather. I have these things from my family. I don't know how they've ended up with me over the years, but that's one of the things that I have. And oh I God. used to be so afraid of suicide and so judgmental. I would just, just write the person off as like a monster mm -hmm. when I was younger. But that was my fear and my judgment, trying to keep me safe, trying to keep me separate from something that scared the shit out of me. Mm -hmm. And she talks about it in her interview. And I always knew that story in my family. And I always wrote him off and just thought he was a, a monster and just, oh, you know, fuck that guy. He's crazy, mm -hmm. crazy. You know what I mean? And then when, when I was 30, one of my best friends killed himself which I write about in the book. And all of a sudden I couldn't write him off as a monster because I knew this person. I knew this person's heart. And he was an incredible, sweet man. And he'd been there for me in my darkest hours. So how could he be a monster? That contradicts itself. So I write about that in the book and that is an example of why it's become a personal memoir because it's me from the catalyst of my grandmother's interview, working through these personal matters in my own life and arriving at these new awakenings. So that was a big one for me. Wow. I mean, I, wow. Yeah, I could, I, I can hear, I mean, I can see what you're saying with, you know, people thinking people, you know, oh, you're a monster for doing that. Cause it's almost like you're probably seeing how it affected everyone else that, you know, in this, in the way of like, oh, that would be a selfish thing. Cause now all these other people are, are hurting due to that. Right. Sure. And then, but when yeah. you knew someone at that level and then seeing it, it's like, oh, well, this person was a great person. And That's right. You know, yeah. yeah. We all deal with these thoughts. We all deal with these thoughts and it's 100%. not black and white and it's very, very uh, tricky and confusing. And these are the things we have to talk about as humans, human to human. You can't do that with an AI. You can't do that with a machine. We need each other. We need to look into each other's eyes and discuss these things. Yeah, I love it. I, I'm really excited to read your book. Um, Thank yeah, you. Yeah, it's, it's definitely, it seems like, obviously it was a huge passion project for you, which turned into this thing. And I wish I had the opportunity, you know, to have that three-day interview with, you know, my grandfather. I think that's such a cool Thing that you'll never forget and not only that you have it on you've filmed it like that's probably something you could always go back and watch and be like oh my gosh like there's my grandma yeah. I'm missing my grandma here's this video i have of her i'm that's I, right I, and what you just so said special. what you just said adam is exactly what i want the book that's the book's purpose in the book um on the cover it says this story will make you want to ask more questions of your loved ones while you still have them <clears throat> and that is my, that's my hope is that everybody who reads it has the reaction that you have and that they actually go and do something about it and change their life and ask these questions and sit their parents down and sit. it's not just our elders. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's our, it's our peers. It's ourselves. We're let's get more curious about ourselves and about each other. 
I can't tell you how many conversations I have where the person doesn't ask a single question about me. I'm sure you've had the same experience yeah. over and over. And you're sitting there going, what is wrong with this picture? Yeah. We are not curious about each other at all. Yeah. And it's not okay. It's not okay. So I really hope that the book inspires us to become more curious. And that starts with the self. Mm -hmm. But if we're running from ourselves and we're not curious about why we are the way we are, why we did that, why we think this way, then we're not going to be curious about others. Right. Yeah. And I mean, going just, I, I love the fact your, your dad got sober when, I mean, when you were 12 years old, that's such a big deal. I've been in the AA program for a while. And like, yeah. I feel like when I started in that, I didn't even know that a lot of that is really that it's self-reflection and being like, oh, damn. Yeah. Like, so like a lot of stuff that you were saying, judgment and all these things, I'm like, oh, I, you know, these are topics that I remember bringing, people bring up a lot. And, and, yeah. and, and I'm really, really excited to read, read this book because we all can uh, benefit from self-examination and kind of seeing what you know other uh, missed opportunities like even just thinking right now like i don't know all that much about my parents like that's i don't right. know what they did that's you right know, who they knew and who they're friends with prior to them meeting like i know they met right. and then that's all i really know from there forward that's right because so. the brain categorizes information that way we, we 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 think we know who each other are and we put each other in these little boxes especially our parents and then they stay there they stay yeah. there and there's no room for expansion and we think that we know everything about them and your parents had an entire life before you right and it's like me no. ju judgment of them or like oh they i was raised this way but it's like well you know, well, how did they get to that? I don't know. It's just, it can just and keep going further yeah. and further and further, further back. And further back because they are just people doing the best they can. And they didn't have a rule book or an instruction book as to how to raise you. And they made mistakes just like <laughs> you're doing as a parent. You yeah, know? I made um, a few. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's just what happens. You, you, you can't win. You know, you're gonna, yeah. you're gonna, you're gonna mess your kids up if you do everything right they'll still say you messed them up so <laughs> exactly uh well lucy yeah. you have been so awesome and so fun to speak to um i'm really excited for your podcast as well and i thought i thought i saw you have another podcast too right where you i had the lucy and annabelle show which yeah. i did for two years that was with annabelle jones and her dad's in the monkeys yeah, Davy um, Jones. That's crazy. That's right. And so <laughs> we had both had major record deals and we started the podcast to discuss all of that and really help help artists just starting out really know how to navigate the music business because mm -hmm. it's hard. And about two weeks into our production of that podcast, her husband, Ryan Brady, who was the executive producer, died in a car crash along with Gosh. his best friend. And so we decided to continue the podcast in real time and work through that process. And the podcast took a hard turn from this lighthearted kind of, you know, rock star daughters who've had record deals, uh, showbiz talk to a grief journey. And mm -hmm. it lasted two years and we ended it when we felt that we were ready, mm -hmm. but you should check that out too, anybody listening, because we did over five, like 60 something episodes and it was quite extraordinary what we uncovered. Yeah, I, I saw that and I was curious about it. I wasn't sure if that was the podcast you were talking about, but it sounds like you have, you have another one that you're going to start. So that's exciting. As well. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> most important is getting this book out into the, the world. Book. It publishes on March 12th. It's available for pre-sale on Amazon. You can type in Remember Me as Human on Amazon and, and get yourself a copy. Um, and the film is on the way. And I just want to mention in partnership with the book, I have joined with an organization called the National Association of Long-Term Care Volunteers. It's a mouthful, but I'm starting to work with them. They bring volunteer companions into nursing homes on a national level. And that's something that I'm very passionate about uh, advocating for in partnership with this book. 
And so I will be doing a lot of work with them. And anybody who wants to be a volunteer companion in nursing homes in your community, it's very easy. You just take this simple online test to get qualified and you can go in and spend your time, whether it's playing music in nursing homes or sitting with somebody and reading to them or just letting them talk about their life or playing cards with them. Just donating your time and being in the nursing homes as a companion is such an incredibly life-changing and life prolonging thing. It really is a fact that loneliness kills. And especially over the last couple of years with COVID, the elderly population has had a very hard time. We're all going to be there one day, maybe if we live long enough. And we got we to gotta shine a light on that area of society because it really gets ignored. I love that. Yeah, I did see similar things that you were talking about earlier in the nursing home when you saw your grandma, when I'd see my grandfather there, it was like really sad. I mean, just the amount yeah. of people that didn't have anyone coming. And I think this is a great program that you're, you're a part of. Um, yeah. Anybody with- who's interested, just reach out to me. I'm on Instagram, the Lucy Walsh on all socials. You can DM me and just get involved. It's super easy and it's not scary. Don't worry. It's very <laughs> doable. And I can answer questions along the way. Amazing. Are you doing an audio version of the book? I'm yes, gonna... I've already recorded it. Oh, it was... amazing. Yeah, I did the audio book. That was so such an incredible experience to do that. It was very daunting to try to get the voice of my grandmother. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> but I, I, I did my best. So that will awesome. publish um, along with the March 12th, 12th release. Oh, is It'll it coming be... out the same day? Maybe not the same day, oh, but right around, around that time. time. So the awesome. book is available in paperback, hardcover, ebook, and audiobook, wherever books are sold. I love it. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to get the hard copy and then I'll, I love the audio book. I will be <laughs> sending you a signed hard copy. <laughs> oh, <don't> you're <laughs> incredible. Thank you so much. You're well, welcome. thank you, Lucy. You have been so much fun to speak to. I have one more question for you. Um I it's, I want to know if you have any advice for aspiring artists, musicians, anyone that is just aspiring to do something, if you have any advice for them. I would say, don't wait until it's perfect. Don't be precious about your art. Just do it. Just get it out and keep moving. Don't try to wait until everything is incredibly perfect or even until you have the right people around you. Don't think you need some big power team to achieve the dreams that you want. I have a big power team and I actually went around a lot of the big power team to do this book because I didn't want to wait on people and I didn't want to wait for other people to give me the green light. So in this day and age, when we have platforms of our own, when we have access to our fans directly, don't wait for it to be perfect. Just do it. 